Matthew 9, and we're going to begin in verse number 18. And the title this morning is The Comfort of Authority, and that uh, sometimes it seems like if you're one under authority, it's like, I don't really find much of comfort in the authority that's over me. Well, that's because we're not talking about uh, Christ. We're talking about a human boss or a supervisor or something like that. But in Christ and the authority that he has, there's great comfort to be found in him. Matthew 9, and if you find verse number 18, if you're physically able, if you'll stand, and we want to honor the reading of God's word this morning. Matthew 9, verse number 18. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment, for she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in, took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And the fame hereof went abroad into all that land. Let's again ask the Lord for his help. Lord, thank you very much for this passage of Scripture. Thank you for these miracles that are true events. These things actually took place. We're grateful for the power then that means that you have. Thank you that you can heal, that you can bring back from the dead. We're certainly grateful. But Lord, greater than physical healing is spiritual healing. Every person here needs to be healed spiritually. That is we're all sinners in need of a great Savior. So, Lord, if there's someone here today that is lost, that is, they're in sin. They, they are a sinner. They've never asked for forgiveness. They never trusted in Christ to save them. Then, Lord, would you help them to understand? Please do what I can't. Convict them of their sin. Show them the wonderful Savior you want to be to them. We love you so very much. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. So as I read through this particular passage, I'm struck with the, just the urgency and the desperation, both on the part of this ruler of the synagogue and of the desperation, the urgency of this woman who just wants to touch the hem of the garment of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the events that take place are, are such a contrast in these verses, verses 18 through 26, is such a contrast from verses 9 through verse number 17. There, in verses 9 through 17, we're witness, if you will, the two separate groups who come to Jesus with some questions about the authority that he's been displaying. We, we saw in, in verses 9 through, uh, down through about verse number uh, 15 or so, that, uh, or verse number 13 rather, that uh, these, these religious leaders come and they're questioning about Jesus' motives. Why, if he's the Savior, why, if he claims to be the Messiah, if he claims to be from God, why is he eating with publicans and sinners? Why is he doing that? And then, beginning in verse number 14, we have the disciples of John, a, a different group, but they're still coming to him, questioning his authority. Why do you do this when, when we and the Pharisees are doing these other, other things? But here, beginning in verse number 18, as even Jesus is answering those questions from the religious leaders and from the disciples of John the Baptist, we're, we're kind of thrust back into the desperate needs, if you will, of this ruler of the synagogue. And, and we're, we're brought back into the realization with this woman who, who is in desperate need of God's healing that it's not just a matter of the questions of who God is. It's a matter of what he, is, what he can do. What is his power? What is his authority? And if, if he has that authority, if he is from God, then he has exactly what I need that no one else can give to me. And that's really the truth of what we're going to be faced with today. Even as Jesus is speaking to these disciples, he's giving the, the answers about who he is, about why he has come. With verse 18, Matthew again brings us back into reality. This, this need that we all have of someone who ultimately can care for our needs. See, I might be able to, to take a prescription or, or something over the counter to, to help me to feel better, 
but I can't take anything, I can't ingest anything that's going to cure me of my sin sickness. I, I can't do that. I can't uh, come up with some cosmic math equation that, that uh, says, well, if I'll do these things, if I'll just, just fill this list, then God will overlook my sins and that will equal my entrance into heaven. There is no math equation for that. I can't, I can't make that take place. And so the Old Testament prophets, and, and we understand Matthew's goal as a Jew writing this gospel is to draw the attention of, again, the Jewish mind back to the Old Testament, back to all these prophecies that pointed them to the Messiah who would come, that is Jesus Christ. And so we look at books like Isaiah and books like Malachi that predicted that, that the Messiah would come, that he would have power, that he would have the authority to bring back the, the wholeness of, of life and that, that sin has a curse and that it takes the wholeness from our life and, and that the Messiah would come and he would wipe that all away. And that's exactly what Jesus is demonstrating. In fact, he does it time and time and time again throughout the Gospel of Matthew. He, he performs these miracles. A Canadian scientist by the name of G.B. Hardy was doing some of his own, his own study and, and he, had, he was looking into religion and he, this is a, a direct quote from him. He said this, when I looked at religion, I said, I have two questions. Number one, has anybody ever conquered death? I had a second question. If they have, did they make a way for me to also conquer death? So I did research. I, I looked into the tomb of Buddha and it was occupied. I, I checked out the tomb of Confucius and sure enough, it was occupied as well. I, I checked the tomb of Muhammad where, where all of these religious adherents go to and, and revere as, 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 as uh, holy sites and it was occupied as well. And then I came to the tomb of Jesus and it was empty. And I said, there is one who conquered death. And so I asked the second question, did he make a way for me to also do it? And so I opened his word, I opened the Bible, and I read in John 14, 19 and discovered that he said, because I live, ye shall live also. Amen. This is the supreme two-part question that every person has to ask themselves. Has there ever been anyone who conquered death? And if so... Has that person made a way for me to conquer death also? Well, I think we're going to understand that you're going to find that the answer in Jesus Christ is absolutely, 100% yes. He's conquered death. And friend, he's made a way for you and I to do it as well. And so I, I look at here with me at Matthew 9. And in, beginning in verse number 18, I, I want us to see some things about Jesus that helps us understand, yes, he can do that in my life as well. Here's thought number one. Jesus is accessible. Jesus is accessible. I have access to him. So while Jesus is addressing the, the, the crowd in verse number 18, the, the criticism, if you will, we find in verse number 18 that someone comes to him. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come. Lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. A certain ruler comes to him and worships him, is what the Bible says. Now, we see the same story take place, the same true account take place, not just in Matthew, but in Mark and in Luke's gospel also. And in Mark and Luke, it tells us that this man was a ruler of the synagogue. And we learn from those gospels that his name was Jairus, if you've heard that name before. Well, as a ruler of the synagogue, what Jairus was going to be responsible for was the, the daily worship that took place at the synagogue. This man, Jairus, was over or supervising all that went on. So all of those priests that would have been serving, all of the, the, the elders, if you will, that would have been daily ministering in the, in the temple, he would have been overseeing those things in this town of Capernaum. Well, if he's in that position, more than likely he's probably a leader of the Pharisees as well. So can you imagine, as the Pharisees question Christ in the, in the first few verses here of Matthew chapter 9, do you think there was any pressure on Jairus to not come to Christ and beg for the life of his daughter? I do. <laughs> Why do you eat with, with sinners? Why do you eat with publicans? We, we don't understand why it is that if you are God, why are you doing these things? Well, Jairus 
doesn't have those questions as much as he has a desperate need that his daughter be healed from this sickness that she is suffering from. He comes to Jesus in verse number 18, and the Bible says that he literally, he worships him. That is, he bows himself down, and automatically that opens him up to criticism and pressure from those who are his, his peers, so to speak. But Jairus is not begging God for himself. He's not coming on behalf of himself. He's coming on behalf of his daughter. It's made out of desperation. Luke's gospel says that this, this lady, this, this young lady, was 12 years old at the time she contracted this illness. And, and the Bible says in those gospels that she, as Jairus is making his way to Christ, she is sick unto death. We get to verse number 18 of Matthew. We, we understand that Jairus believes, for all intents and purposes, she's dead. She's dead. In fact, when you read Mark's account of this, this transaction that takes place, when Jairus comes to Christ, there are others from his house that have already left his house and they have come to see where he's at and they say to him, hey, don't bother the master, she's already dead. It doesn't make any sense to do it now. She's already passed away. She's already had her life taken from her. She's, she's a young 12-year-old girl, girl and, and at the very time when she's coming into adulthood in the, the Jewish culture, if you will, she has had her life taken from her. Well, Jairus still believes that the only one he can turn to is Jesus Christ. He, he's already healed other people. He's already seen, he's already heard the accounts that Jesus has, has caused the, the lame to walk. And, and he's, he's even stated that he is forgiving people of their sins. And so Jairus asks Jesus to do what is humanly impossible to do. No one in here can give life back to someone who is dead. None of us can do that. In fact, in Mark's account, some people come again and they, they say, stop, stop bothering Jesus. Don't, don't, don't bother the Savior anymore. But the request that he makes in verse number 18 shows that God had to have been working on Jairus' heart. Because there's, there's nothing but absolute conviction that Jesus was able to do exactly what he's asking him to do. Read it again. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, now here's what he says, my daughter is even now, what? Dead. But come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. See, there's no doubt in his mind. This man can do what no other man can do. He can heal my daughter. His peers, those other religious leaders, looked at Jesus with a doubting eye, with a condemning eye. And even though they wouldn't come to Jesus directly, you remember, they, they go to the disciples and ask the questions. They wouldn't come to Jesus directly to voice their disapproval. Nothing is going to keep Jairus. Nothing is going to hinder him from approaching the Savior. And what I love is that Jesus to Jairus, who's in desperate need of healing for his dead daughter, Jesus is accessible to him. The very same group of people who had been condemning him and questioning him and, in fact, plotting to kill him. The same person, the same individual out of one of those groups comes to Jesus and Jesus doesn't shoo him away or shy him away. Jesus is accessible to him. See, Jesus is not some religious guru who surrounds himself with a bunch of servants, and you have to go through the servants in order to get to the master. He is not some, some religious person who separated himself from the lives and, and the activities of everyday people. No, the Bible says in John 1.14, and the world, word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He walked with people. He spoke with people. He spent time with the rich and time with the poor. He spent time with the healthy and with the sick. He spent time with the noble person and time with the outcast. The young, the old, the male, the female, the Jew, the Gentile. Every one of them had access to Christ. He's accessible. Amen. You can come to Him. Okay, if, the same, if that is true in Matthew 9, the same is true today. He is accessible to you today. He's accessible to anyone who is here today. And not just here. He's accessible if you're walking down the street. 
He's accessible if you're at your home. He's accessible if you're at your job. By the way, I think that's one of the wonderful truths about prayer is that Jesus, the God of all the universe, is accessible to you if you'll come to him. Not only is he accessible, and it, it's similar in its idea, but I, I wanted to show you just a, in a different way. Jesus is not just accessible. Number two, Jesus is available. The response to Jesus, or to, to Jairus' request, rather, in verse number 19, is so simple. He, he's begging Jesus to come, and notice what Jesus does in verse number 19. Well, if you earn it. Well, if you spend some time as my disciple, then I might come. No, no. Jesus arose and followed him. And so did his disciples. See, not only could Jairus be, have, have access to Christ, to the healer, but the healer was available to Jairus. What we oftentimes think of as, well, I don't want to bother somebody, or, or what other people came to Jairus and said, well, don't bother the Messiah now. He's busy doing other things that are more important. Your daughter is dead. No, no. He is available to, his, to hear your request. Could Jesus have healed Jairus' daughter just by speaking the word? Yes. Yes. But what does he do? He's willing to be interrupted, so to speak, and travel all the way to Jairus' house out of his way to serve other people in his father's name. But the availability of Jesus is not just to Jairus in this passage. It is to anyone who desires his presence. So while Jesus is following Jairus to his home, whose daughter is dead, we read of another interruption, so to speak, beginning in verse number 20 in Jesus' day. Behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may, be may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. Interruption of Jairus while Jesus is speaking. The interruption then of this woman while Jesus is going to Jairus' house to, to heal this dead daughter. This interruption, so to speak, becomes just another opportunity for the Savior. Now, I want you to hold your place in Matthew. I want you to turn over to Mark's gospel, Mark's account of this. In Mark chapter number 5, and I think it helps us to, to kind of get some additional information, if you will. Mark 5, look at verse number 24. Mark 5, 24. Jairus has made his plea, verse 24, and Jesus went with him, and much people followed him, and here's the thought, and thronged him. Now that word thronged is an interesting word, we don't necessarily use that in our language today, but it means to compress in on, or to crowd on all sides. So you see Jesus, uh, Jairus has approached him, and he's begging for the life of his daughter, and said, if you will just lay your hand on her, she will come back to life. So Jesus agrees, he follows Jairus, and as he begins to leave speaking to these disciples of John, he turns, and as he goes, all of these people are crowding around Jesus. It's almost like you can see this little patch of two people, Jairus and Jesus, walking, and the crowd is just kind of enveloping them as they walk. And so all these people are coming and crowding around Jesus. Certainly they're, they're, they're touching him and they're, they're brushing up against him and, and all of these things are taking place. So in this, this large crowd, everyone is pressing in on, on the Savior. They're, they're following with Jesus and the disciples. This woman, who also needed healing, makes her way, works herself into a position, and, and she says in her own mind, that's what gospel, Matthew's gospel says, in, my own, in her own mind she thinks, if I can just reach out and touch his clothing, I'll be healed. He, he has enough power to, to, to do that in, in my life, verse 21, if I'll just touch the hem of his garment in order to gain the healing that she so desperately needed. But I want to draw your attention to verse number 22 back in Matthew chapter number 9. And I want you to see Jesus' reaction to what this lady does. By the way, this lady is not wanting attention. And we're going to talk about that here in just a second. She doesn't, she's not looking for attention. She's just looking to reach out and touch Jesus' garment. She's just looking for Jesus to be available. But notice what Jesus does in verse number 22. But Jesus turned him about. And when he saw her, he said, daughter... Be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. 
surrounded by this crowd, headed to exercise God's healing power in the life of a 12-year-old girl, thronged by others who, who want to watch what happens, Jesus stops, turns himself, and acknowledges this woman. Can I just make a little bit of application here? And I hope it's a blessing to you. It was a blessing to me. You need to understand that you today, you're not lost in the crowd with Jesus Christ. Amen. He knows every intimate detail of your life. He can turn and acknowledge you at any time. By the way, I think there are several times during the day when he does that in my life. And if he's doing that in my life, can I just say he's doing that in your life also? You are not lost to Christ. He, he is aware of everything going on in your life. Now, look back at Mark chapter number 5, and I, I want to just point something else out. Mark 5, look at verse number 30. We're in verse 24. The people followed him, thronged him. Look down at verse number 30 of Mark 5. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, that's when the, the woman touches him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, probably what we would say also, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched thee? Um, Jesus, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's a lot of people here. And there's a lot of people that are touching you. And they're pressing in on you and they're surrounding us. And now you're asking the question, who touched me? Uh, look around. <laughs> Everyone is touching you. Do you understand that in Jesus' earthly ministry, thousands of people came in contact with Christ? They spoke with him. They, came, they, they touched him. But what we need to understand, the difference between just simply touching or approaching Christ out of mere curiosity and the one who approaches him in need is the difference of faith. Yes, See, I can go and get close to, to, to Christ. That is, I can come to a church service. I can read his word. I, I can understand or even see what he is saying. But if I don't come in faith, then the power is not appropriated to me. Uh, there are tons of people who come close to God. Who, who, who do their research and they're looking into God and, and they're, they're, they're supposed... Have you ever met somebody that says, I've read the Bible all the way through? I've met a lot of people that say that. A lot of people. I've read the Bible all the way through. You understand, they've come close to God. They, they've read what His Word has to say. But the difference is, their faith is not exercised in Him. This woman touched Jesus by faith. And her need, that she was in desperate need, her need was met, taken care of. Jesus is available, but what we receive from him is dependent on the manner of our approach to him. See, salvation is available to every person. But it doesn't just happen because you come in your own way or of your own accord. It doesn't just happen because you say, well, I want to be saved, and God loves me, and because I know that, then I believe I'm saved. Or, well, I was born into a Christian family, I've brought up, been brought up in church all my life, and, uh, you know, I just, I've been a Christian all my life. No, you have not. No, you have to approach Christ individually by faith, trusting Him for forgiveness of sin and for salvation. Jesus is accessible Jesus is available, number three, in our passage back in Matthew. I want you to understand that Jesus is also impartial. He is impartial. So think through who's involved here in, in the, the passage this morning. One man, a Jewish religious leader who has a 12-year-old daughter who has enjoyed life up to this point but now has died. One woman, a religious and social outcast unable to be healed by anyone else for the past 12 years. This woman, because of her, her issue of blood, because she is constantly bleeding, you understand, no one can come near and even touch her. They, they would be made unclean also. She can't go into the temple and enter into worship. She can't bring a sacrifice to atone for, for her uncleanness. She can't do it. She's continually unclean. And anyone that comes near her or approaches her or touches her, they are also to be made unclean. And so you understand, this lady is, is an outcast to everyone else. No one wants a part of her. She's unable to be healed. She's gone to doctors 
And the, the other Gospels, Mark and Luke, tell us that she has given, paid all that she had. Mark said that the doctors that she's been under have even used and abused her. They, they haven't even treated her well. Luke said, who by the way, remember Luke was a physical doctor, he makes the, the declaration that no one could heal her. This woman comes to Jesus and Jesus is not impartial toward her need. He will heal anyone who comes by faith to him. One was a person of influence. The other was someone no one wanted to pay attention to. Both of them came to Christ in faith that He alone could meet their need. And He does exactly that to both of them. He meets both of their need. Neither of these people, by the way, were an interruption to Jesus. Neither of them. Matthew 20 and verse number 28. Here's what Jesus came for. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. Acts 10 and verse number 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Amen. Well, you don't know what I've done. You, you don't know the people that I've talked to that said I can't be saved because the color of my skin or because of where I come from or, or because of what I've done in my past. I want you to understand Jesus is accessible. Amen. He's available. He's impartial. You're not saved because of who you are. You're saved because of whose you are and because of who Jesus Christ is. Position, prestige, possessions, they give no advantage with Christ. And a lack of those things gives no disadvantage. You can come. He's available. He's accessible to you. He will not turn you away. Well, I've been taught that only certain people can be saved, and even if I wanted to, I can't be saved. That's a lie of the devil. No, no, he's, he's available. He's accessible. He's impartial. If you come, he will forgive. He will save. But it's not just knowing he'll do it. You have to actually come to him. Confess your sins. Repent of those sins. Ask him to forgive your sins. And then trust in Him to save your soul. He said He'd do it. Amen. He's accessible. He's available. He's impartial. Fourth and finally, Jesus is all-powerful. I want you to look back in Matthew chapter 9, verse number 22. And I want you to see the outcome for this woman who came to Jesus by faith. No one else wanted her. Notice what happens. Verse 22, the last part of verse number 22. Jesus turned to him about. We'll just read the whole verse. Jesus turned about, and when he saw her, he said, what's the word? Daughter. What's daughter? Is that a family term? Yeah. Yeah, she's been made to be in the family. Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. She had dealt with this continual bleeding for 12 years. Can you imagine? 12 years. Mistreated, unable to be healed, all her money gone, and all that she does. Mark says that she became worse and worse and worse. But when she came to Jesus, immediately, immediately, she's healed. You know what some religion teaches people? That if you will do your best, if you'll work hard, if you'll uh, uh, go by these sacraments or by these commandments, if you'll just, just continue on and you'll continue in your studies and you'll get to the point where one day you'll be confirmed, then you can be saved. No, no. It can happen today. Today. Today your sin can be forgiven. Today you can know that you have a promised home in heaven. He is all-powerful to be able to do that. And lest we forget, it's not just this lady, this 12-year-old girl who had recently died. Notice what the power of God brought about in her life. Look at verse number 23. Jesus came into the ruler's house, saw the minstrels and the people making a noise. He said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. So when Jesus arrives... 
The people were mourning. Usually that's a loud affair. And you would pay people. This is, it's amazing in this culture. You would pay people to come in and to play some flutes and to weep and to wail and to mourn. And you'd, you'd, you'd say over and over and over again that the person who died, you'd say their name. And then as the, the day grew on, you, they would include the names of other people in your family who had died. And you just, you're, you're adding on mourning and mourning and mourning. So Jesus walks into that and they're, they're loud and they're carrying on. And when he tells them to give place, it literally means to, to get out. Because what they know to be true about this girl is not what Jesus knows about this girl. Their mourning in verse number 24, it's just, I, I almost laugh when I read this, this verse. But as much as they're weeping and, and wailing and mourning, in the moment he tells them to get out, what does it turn into? Laughing laughing. They're not mourning this girl. They're, they're doing what they're paid to do. And they don't even know the truth about who this girl is or, or what God is going to do in her life. They don't even know who has walked into the room. And they begin to laugh at Jesus and to, to scorn him, to make fun of him. But Jesus' power isn't diminished by mocking and by scorning. He, he's not limited by their unbelief. Jairus, the, the leader of the tabernacle, has already exercise. He's already displayed his faith in Jesus. That's verse number 18. And that is what Jesus is now acting on. And again, it is Jesus' power that sets him apart from every other man on the face of the earth. What these people in verse 23 could not do, Jesus can do just by speaking the word. He can bring life back to this young girl. So Jesus is accessible, available, and impartial, but he also has the power. See, I can, I can be those things to somebody else. I can be accessible. I can be available. I can be impartial toward other people. But only God has the ultimate power to heal from leprosy, to raise the dead, to heal from de demonic possession, to bring this girl back to life, to heal an issue of blood for 12 years. Only God has the power to be able to do those things. And the point of all this, as we, we bring this to a conclusion, the point of all the, these events in verses 18 through 26 is that this is exactly what Jesus wants to do in the case of everyone who is saved from their sins. He, he wants us to understand who he is, what he can do in our lives. So, so think with me. What does sin do to every one of us? It makes us to be unclean. That, that's what sin does in my life. It contaminates me. It, it makes it so that n I cannot stand in the presence of a holy God until my sin is dealt with. And I can't bring sacrifices. I can't give enough money in the offering. I can't serve at a million VBSs. I, I can't do that and earn God's forgiveness or God's grace. My sin has separated me from a holy God. Well, if I'm separated, here's what sin also does. Sin isolates me. It, it separates me from God. And when I continue in my sin, you know what it does in my family life? Sin will break apart my family. Sin will separate me from brothers and sisters. Sin creates hurt in family and in friendships. It creates hard feelings and misunderstandings. And so my condition is hopeless. Who do I go to? What, what do I do apart from God's grace? There is nothing more hopeless than death in your life. So turn to Ephesians 2 and we're finished. Ephesians 2. There's nothing more hopeless than death. Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians 2, look at verse number 1. And you hath he quickened, that is to be made alive. You hath he quickened who were, what's the word? Dead in trespasses and sins. Yeah, but I was, I mean, I was alive. Yeah, but in your spirit you were dead. You were dead in trespasses and sins. Skip down to verse number four. But God, 
who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? Verse 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. What a wonderful picture of the love, grace, and resurrection power that Jesus Christ has alone in the healing of Jairus' dead daughter, the healing of this woman whose issue of blood had been for 12 years, and Jesus' authority gives me hope in the midst of my despair. Though I was dead in trespasses and sins, but God, verse 4, who is what? Rich in mercy. And because he loved me, he forgave my sin. He quickened my spirit. He made me to be alive. He did what no one else can do. He brought me back from the dead so that I might live for Him. And not so that I might live or continue to sin. Not that I might praise myself. No, no. Verse 7 says that I might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness. That I might glorify God in my body and in my spirit which are God's. See, other people might have authority over you, but the authority that Christ has is the only thing that can bring hope in your life. He has the authority to forgive your sins and to save your soul. He alone has the authority to do that. That's a comforting thought. That when I can't go to anyone else, I can't do anything about myself. He can. He will if I'll come to Him. And He can make your life to be a wonderful testimony of His power as well. If you'll come to Him by faith. If you'll trust Him. He wants to do it.